I'm Brian Stilla with Nomadic Dino, and I have a short list here of common things that either cause a reschedule or cause problems with EFI systems. Hey everyone, I kind of screwed up a little bit when I was recording this and had stuff off of the screen. So uh, I put in some visual aids, apologies for the poor recording. I tried to reshoot it a couple times and I just got worse at it every time. So enjoy the video. Most of what I do is ACES EFI, but this applies across the board. One of the most common things that causes issues is spark. This is mostly a throttle body setup that's used in time and control and a distributor. Um, probably the most common one is incorrect firing order. Several times, people check three, four times, and it's still the wrong firing order. I just ran into this twice in the same day last week. Um, the wrong spark plugs, sometimes the, the fancier spark plugs aren't really doing you any favors. Just stick with a basic copper core like a V-Power or something like that. Um, not really realizing your plugs are fouled to all hell. Um, pull them out and they're fuel soaked, just get a new set. You're likely not going to get them to recover. Um, another thing causes a lot of uh, popping and banging kind of Weird behavior uh, is the distributor being out of phase. What I mean by that is the rotor is not a moment. Better to just have something to show you. All right. So what I, what I mean by that is you have your paddle inside of here for a magnetic pickup. That's what this is. It's a 383 ACES EFI magnetic pickup for a, a big block Mopar. But you have the paddles that line up with magnetic pickup. And then you have a rotor in relation to that. And then where it is going to be on the cap. If, like if you're trying to get right there, but your rotor is trying to fire when it's, you know, in between a couple, the spark is going to jump between them. So that's why companies make these adjustable uh, phasing rotors so that you can get it dialed in so your paddle is in the right spot on the pickup and your uh, rotor is in the right spot on the cap and there's lots of YouTube videos how to do that uh, look it up for one manufacturer it applies to them all oh balancer mark is wrong um, verify top dead center either with a piston stop or while you're building the engine however you want to do it but make sure your balancer mark is actually accurate to the timing mark on your timing cover. This can be wrong. It happens. Sometimes balancers are not all made equal, especially if you're getting some, some jungle parts. Maybe they're not very accurate. Um, if you find that the harmonic balancer has slipped on the rubber isolator, junk it, get a new one before it comes apart on you. Uh, because that is going to determine how you set up the rest of it. So if it's wrong, Everything else you do is wrong, even though you think it's right. Um, another thing, if you have uh, kind of an intermittent misfire, just happen to get a dead cylinder, uh, melt the plug wires. I go through a lot of them because of the way headers are on these cars and cheap headers, I should add. Very cheap headers. So, yeah, this happens. So if you get in your vehicle one day and turn it on and all of a sudden it's misfiring bad, check this. That goes for LS stuff too and anything that has a spark plug wire near exhaust. It can happen. All right, second thing, voltage. Um, alternator's not charging. Make sure your alternator's charging. Make sure you're getting, you know, over 13 volts at idle. Uh, EFI does not like to run at lower voltage, especially with timing control. That control that contributes to your injectors firing, your spark, everything. So make sure you got good voltage. Uh, make sure you have good voltage while you're cranking as well. And on that note, make sure your ignition source does not get interrupted while you're cranking. If you go to crank it and your screen flashes as you crank it, that's not a good source. You need to change it to something that does not drop voltage while you're cranking it. That causes the computer to shut off for a split second and turn back on. 
and go through its entire startup process again, but it doesn't shut off long enough to save any changes you might have made. It has to shut down properly to save any changes. Um, not having the um, power direct to the battery and ground. If you have your positive wire that goes to the battery and you have it interrupted, I have another video on this one. If you have it interrupted to where like you flip a switch and that main power wire going to your battery gets interrupted, it will never save the data that you changed on the laptop or handheld or whatever. You have to have a constant power and ground so that the ECU can shut down properly. Then once it shuts down properly, you can unplug the thing, throw it on a shelf for a year, and the tune's still there. It just has to be able to shut down properly. Fuel pressure, fuel supply. Uh, or biggest thing is not having a mechanical gauge or a sensor so that you can tell when you do have a fuel pressure issue because it can you can have something start and kind of half-ass run on very little pressure but obviously it doesn't work right same thing with too much pressure you can actually go beyond and have too much pressure and cause whole different issues um, those cheap amazon wherever jungle Filter regulators that are supposed to regulate it at 58 PSI. Well, that depends on how much flow you're putting through and a whole bunch of other variables. If you're gonna run one of those, at least run a gauge or a sensor or both so that you know when it fails and then you can throw the 30 spare ones you have in your glove box in it because um, not the most reliable thing in my experience. It has caused a lot of headaches. Uh, inadequate pressure clogged injectors inadequate pressure kind of goes with the same as what i was talking about if you have you know a restriction in your supply line or anything weird like that that'll do it too or if you have your regulator set up wrong and it's just trickling fuel to the throttle body uh, clogged injectors this one so like if you see down the barrel while it's running and you have you know one or two injectors spraying really good and the other two are just kind of trickling or doing nothing Take it apart and clean the injectors, see if it works. Um, as far as warranty and stuff goes, yeah, check with your whoever manufacturer first, see if it's gonna avoid anything. But take pictures and videos of everything you're doing, pull it apart, show your findings, etc. put it back together, just document it well, and they'll probably work with you very well if there is a true issue. Um, cold start. This is a fuel pressure thing. Um, when you cycle it on and your fuel pump primes, this is where you need a gauge again. Um, you'll see it spike up to wherever you have it set or whatever the internal regulator is, usually 58 PSI in a lot of cases. If the pump stops priming and your needle just bottoms out right away, you have no residual pressure in your um, pressure side of the fuel system. So that means your throttle body has nothing in it or it's very little, not enough to do anything. And eventually it'll drain back to the tank or at least back into the lines a little bit. So when you go to start one of these, you'll turn the key on, you'll hear all four injectors pulse twice, I think. Um, and the amount changes depending on a lot of settings. Um, if you don't have any pressure in your line, you turn that key on, those injectors fire before the pump can get pressure to this. So they're shooting air. So that's why you might find that if you prime it a couple of times, it starts better. That's usually why. It's usually not a tuning thing. It's usually a, there's no fuel in here thing. Uh, sometimes it can be tuning, but usually it's that. So when ideally, with like a check valve or however you have to set it up. When you prime it, fuel pressure rises, turn the key off. It should either hold or just super slowly come down and maintain something. A very low amount of pressure in here, like let's just say 10 PSI for an easy example, is good enough to still have fuel in here so that when you, when you turn the key on, there's instant pressure and it's it's actually putting fuel into the bowls. Oh. <clears throat> Next, vacuum slash exhaust leaks. Kind of group these together just because. 
Uh, intake manifold leaks, super common, especially on LS stuff for whatever reason. Um, throttle body gasket leaks where this mounts will have leaks, especially if you have a spacer, there's a solid chance of something not being tight or a gasket got eight. Uh, these plugs that are all missing off of this one, you need those. Or um, let's say you have them hooked up to things like a brake booster, transmission servo, a piece of e-valve, whatever. Make sure those things aren't leaking vacuum past it. Like I uh, had a lot of times where a piece of e-valves are just a free flow. That's not good. So that, that'll make it idle high like you have a vacuum leak because it is a vacuum leak. Same with brake boosters and everything. If they've got a leak, this will see it as a vacuum leak and pull in more air. Uh, and what you might run into on that is, depending on your intake and setup, these ports are on more on one side than the other. So you might have one bank, if it's a single plane, um, might have one bank running leaner than the other because of that. That goes for the multi-port setups too with the fuel rails, but a throttle body type uh, style flange. Uh, four barrel throttle body type flange. Header leaks, I mean, that those are all kind of obvious, but they happen. Um, major exhaust leaks, um, here's another one, ah, show and tell here. So this header, hopefully don't crush that laptop. Um, ideally you want to have the O2 sensor back further than this. Yes, I ran them obviously like this. A lot of people will go to fire it up for the first time with this. This is it. Put a two foot extension on the thing, three foot, whatever, just go get some dirt cheap pipe from the parts store and like 20 bucks for a chunk of pipe. Put that on after it. That's it. That's usually enough to get the O2 sensor to read good enough or, you know, put two of them in a row. Then you can listen to your open header happy noises and your O2 sensor will work properly. Otherwise, this is going to read all that fresh air that's right there making the computer think it's lean and it is going to dump as much fuel as it can, chasing a carrot it will never get and just overfuel everything. This, yeah, this leaked bad. <clears throat> that one was kind of junk. All right, moving on. Map sensors. Um, there's ways to tell if your map sensor works or doesn't work. I have one video that kind of half covers it. I need to make another video that does cover it. If I ever do, I'll link it on here. Um, wrong sensor for the application. Make sure if you're running boost, this is more for the LS multiport stuff. If you're running boost, make sure you have, you know, a two, three, four bar sensor. <laughs> um, make sure it reads correctly. There's ways to test it. If you have a, like an aftermarket one, get the specs for it. If you can't get the specs for it, get one that you can. So you know at what voltage is what KPA. Then you can use, you can set up a custom table for pretty much any of them. Um, map sensor part two-ish has to do with the ACES throttle bodies. These are made so you can either run them on a root style blower or blow through. Or draw through or blow through. <clears throat> they have a port in the bottom of here that comes open. Sometimes people like to put that plug in there because they see a hole and plug it. That is where your map sensor reads on your intake also. So if your intake is blocking that, you're going to have some weird issues. It is offset a little bit, but the better flow it can get, the better. Um, this will make it act really weird um, because as it heats up it'll actually read as if you're in boost or over 100 kpa and then as it cools down it will you know go lower than that because it has this tiny little pocket of air that's expanding and shrinking in there so make sure 
that plug is not installed if you're having some weird throttle body map issues. That's the first thing to check. Okay, and then kind of an honorable mention is computer. Um, don't write off any aftermarket ECU until you hook up a computer to it and start doing some tuning. The more universal something is, the less it's going to work on every application. Uh, like let's say you get Terminator X kits that are for LSs. They're only aimed at one engine platform or, you know, a jackpot LS. It's one platform. So the parameters can be a lot more narrow and work better on different LSs. Still, you have to hook up to them and tune them to really get what you need to out of them. Um, this is like 180 bucks. It's a refurbished computer off of Amazon. They're cheap, you don't need anything fancy. Just make sure it has a good enough processor like an i5 and then 16 gigs of RAM or more. Yeah, 181 bucks. Spend more on that and fuel in a week on something like the car behind me. Um, if you are doing remote tuning with someone or having someone else remote tune you, don't use a work laptop for like a, a corporate computer because they're typically going to have all your firewalls and everything super tight and no one will be able to get in there. So you'll schedule something three weeks out, finally get ready to go on and no one can connect in because you're using a work laptop that is like four knocks. Um, they're, they're cheap. Just get one, leave it with the car. It'll be one of the cheaper things you ever get for your car. Uh, and like Aces sends the USB CAN cable with every one of them or every kit. So you don't really have an excuse there either. Those are just a few of the things that can help you get on the right track and see maybe what's going on with your system and save everyone time in the long run. Thank you for watching.